Welcome to Techmar Snow Melting Webinar Training Series. My name is Elizabeth Brown. I am a Technical Support Specialist at Techmar Controls, and I will be your host for this webinar training series. This series of snow melting webinars will include eight individual segments so that you can pick and choose and, in the end, customize your very own training path. The first two segments include generalized information about snow melting. So if you're new to the concept of snow melting, we recommend you start here. The third segment is specialized for Tecmar snow melting controls and sensors. The fourth segment introduces the seven featured applications for our newest snow melting control, the 654. Segments 5, 6, and 7 will introduce the features of the 654. And the final segment in 8 will cover the technical information for the 654, including electrical diagrams and essential settings for those seven featured applications. We'll begin with our first segment, an introduction to snow melting. The outline for today's presentation will begin with the reasons for choosing snow melting. Next, we'll take a look at the differences between hydronic and electric snow melting systems. And lastly, we'll look at some general best practices for snow melting. Beginning with the choice for snow melting, why would we install a snow melting system? Well, there are many reasons why. We'll go through all of them today in this presentation. The first one being convenience. A snow melting system means no time commitment and no labor commitment to shovel your driveways, walkways, and pathways. And when we eliminate the labor, we're also removing the associated personal risks. You may find it surprising that there are a lot of ER visits from injuries attributed to shoveling and snow blowing. A recent 16-year study showed an average of 11,500 shoveling injuries and 6,000 snowblower injuries resulting each year in the U.S. Particularly individuals who are at risk for cardiac arrest, shoveling may present a risk that is best avoided. And unless there is a well-priced and available teenager in your life, snow melting is a terrific solution. An additional consideration may also be how difficult the area is to clear. Perhaps a very long driveway or pathway, or perhaps like what we've shown here, an outdoor hot tub area. Installing a snow melt system in areas like this may be particularly desirable. Safety is another big reason why people install snow melt systems. An absence of snow or ice accumulation means a reduced hazard from slips, falls, or vehicular accidents. So it's perfect in applications like ramps. It's also great just for walkways going to your house. I know my own grandmother did not like to leave her apartment in the winter because she was so afraid of falling and breaking a hip. Um, so a snow melting system will eliminate that worry. We're also going to reduce the liability and the potential for lawsuits. And perhaps there's also a potential for reduced insurance premiums as well. So safety is a big reason why we might consider installing a snow melt system. Another reason would be if we're doing a commercial application. So examples of this would be a hospital, a car wash, helicopter pad, industrial applications and entranceways. With the snow melting system, we reduce the likelihood of injury or property damage from falls or collisions. And of course, it makes perfect sense for critical safety areas that must be kept free of snow or ice, like a hospital entrance. We can also reduce floor maintenance costs by minimizing tracked snow and slush. So I know my own university where I attended had a snow melt system, and one of the primary reasons was to reduce the tracked snow slush through all of the buildings. Protection is another reason why we might choose a snow melting system. Protection of the surface itself and also protection of the building. So if we have textured or colored concrete or brick like what we've shown here, or if we have stone surfaces, these can all become damaged from snow removal equipment and corrosive de-icers. Buildings are often damaged by snowplow equipment as well, so to remove that risk of damaging the slab or ensuring we have the maximum longevity of our slab in our building, it's a great reason to consider a snowmelt system. Once we've decided upon a snowmelt system, we have another choice. Are we going to go with an electric snowmelt system or a hydronic snowmelt system? An electric system will have mats or cable contained within the slab. And a hydronic system will have piping embedded in the slab itself. 
and we'll look at the differences and the advantages and disadvantages of each of these systems in the upcoming slides. The advantages of having an electric snowmelt system include a lower installation cost and a reduced warm-up time. And what that means is you'll have a faster system response. The disadvantage of an electric snowmelt system is that you have no choice of fuel. So you are stuck with your electrical utility and are very susceptible to the changing rates. The advantages of a hydronic snowmelt system are that you have your choice of fuel. So you can use alternative methods, you could combine it um, with a high efficiency boiler and perhaps even try to use some solar or geothermal. So you have that option of, of using an assortment of different fuels and that will lower your operating costs. The disadvantage of a hydronic system is that it does have a higher installation cost and there may be some maintenance required. So it is a big decision to go with electric or hydronic and what are the factors that you should consider? One of the biggest factors will be the utility cost and the availability of other power options. So you can take a close look at what is the cost of electricity where you live and how does that compare to other options such as oil, natural gas, geothermal or solar. You also need to consider what your space availability is like. Do you have enough room for the hydronic equipment that's required? I would also encourage you to look at the user expectations. How does the customer expect the system to operate? And how does the customer feel about responsiveness versus cost? What is most important to them? And that will really help guide the selection here. Is it a new installation or is it a retrofit? Electric cables are easier to retrofit. And how many snow events per year does your area see? So the more times a year your system is likely to operate, that probably means you're going to start looking at cheaper fuel options. Here's a cost comparison where we're going to compare the yearly operating costs for a hydronic system and an electric system in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Here our hydronic system is going to come from natural gas and we have made some assumptions here. There are 159 melting hours per year in Colorado Springs and that's according to ASHRAE data. Our slab is a thousand square feet. We have an area free ratio of 0.5 and we'll get into what that area free ratio means in the upcoming segment but for now let's just say that you have a moderate amount of tolerance for snow accumulation on your slab. And we're also looking at a cold start here with the automatic start and stop. So to compare the natural gas ver version versus electricity, our cold start is going to cost us $275 with natural gas. If we're looking at electricity, it is more than doubled at $650. And now if we're getting into idling our system, the natural gas is going to run us $1,300 a year, where electricity will be $3,000 a year. So in an, a situation like this, it would definitely make more sense to install a hydronic system and use natural gas than it would be to depend on electricity. Now, if you break that down, because ASHRAE also publishes the number of snow events per year, and in Colorado Springs, that is 29. So if I take this number and divide it by 29, it works out to $9.50 per snow event. So I don't know of any other snow removal method that will be cheaper than $9.50. So some people think that snow melt systems are too expensive, that they are prohibitively expensive, but when you break it down to the cost per use, you are likely to see that return on investment pretty quick. I should also state here that the electric cost, the numbers we're using to uh, arrive at these figures would be $29 per million BTU and for natural gas it's $12.50 per million BTU and that's a national average for the US. Those figures came from the US Energy Information Administration. Another cost comparison where we don't have quite as many snow melting hours. In this case we're looking at Seattle, Washington. According to ASHRAE, they only see 27 melting hours per year. So even though natural gas is still cheaper here, we're looking for cold start $40 for natural gas, whereas we're looking at $100 for electricity. Because the cost to operate with electricity is still so low, 
you're probably not going to see that return on investment to go with a hydronic system. So in a case like this where you have a low amount of melting hours per year in a climate like Seattle, you would probably want to install an electric snowmelt system as opposed to a hydronic snowmelt system. We'll take a look at some of the best practices associated with snow melting. And those are going to include tubing, insulation, drainage, slab temperature control, and freeze protection. For tubing, we'll look at the tube spacing. And that can range from 4 to 6 inches if it's a critical snow melt area to 8 to 10 inches for typical residential applications. We like to see reverse return layout. That's recommended for even heat distribution. And your typical maximum circuit length for 3 quarter inch PEX will be 300 feet. It's not advised to exceed 300 feet. Now insulation is also a best practice. It is critical for performance, efficiency, and control. So according to ASHRAE, back and edge losses can vary from 4% all the way to 50%. And insulation will reduce those losses. And when you reduce the losses, we increase our energy savings because we're not wasting energy to the air or the ground. And it's also going to decrease our response time. So two big advantages there to using insulation. So insulation obviously channels the heat in the direction where it's wanted. And if we have that well insulated slab, we can get to melt temperature quickly while reducing our losses. The preferred material is one or two inch thick rigid polystyrene foam. We've shown it here in blue. And we haven't shown insulation under the slab and that is because it can increase the risk of frost due to the low thermal mass. So some people do use uh, insulation under the slab and of course there are situations where you would want to. Um, certainly if there is a high water table in your area then you want to use insulation under the slab but here we've only shown it at the edge because we are trying to decrease the risk of frost. Drainage is another best practice in snow melting. If we don't have proper drainage we are going to waste heat because we're going to be using that heat to evaporate the meltwater. And evaporated meltwater requires approximately 900 times more energy than melting the snow. So you can see it's a quick way to have your system really operate out of control and have extremely high um, operating costs. Now to have effective drainage, you may require drains to be heated so they don't freeze up. And this could be done by wrapping tubing around the drain pipe. Slab temperature control is another best practice of associated with snow melting. And we want slab temperature control because we don't want to waste energy and we want to protect our slab. So if our slab is being heated too quickly and the temperature differential is too great, then we are at risk of cracking from thermal shock. So you probably have seen cement slabs that have cracked as a result of snow melting. And that would be because there was no slab temperature control. So effective control is essential. We want to keep that slab surface temperature constant. And the way we do that is we vary the temperature to the inner core in relation to the outdoor temperature changes. So if the outdoor temperature drops, we will increase the temperature of the inner core to keep that slab surface temperature constant. And another best practice is freeze protection. So we're talking about snow melt. These typically operate at very low temperatures. So a glycol water mixture is essential. We want to make sure that our system does not experience damage from freezing. So I've shown two glycol water mixtures here. We have ethylene and propylene. Propylene is the standard because it is non-toxic, unlike ethylene, which is toxic. So we do recommend going with propylene. And you want to choose a solution that will give you a freezing point of at least 5 degrees colder than the lowest expected ambient temperature. And that typically means choosing about 40% propylene. 
We also recommend you use a circulator aquastat to prevent your heat exchangers from freezing. And we'll look at the use of those circulator aquastats um, as we look at the applications for the snow melting control 654. In summary, in this first training segment, we looked at the reasons why we would choose a snow melting system in the first place. And those reasons are for convenience, for safety reasons, for commercial applications such as car washes, helipads, and hospitals, and for protection of the slab surface and for the building itself. Next, we looked at the differences between hydronic and electric snow melting systems and looked at the advantages and disadvantages of each as well as some cost comparisons. And lastly, we took a look at the best practices associated with snow melting. In particular, we looked at the tubing, insulation, drainage, slab temperature control, and freeze protection. If you want to learn more about general control methods for a snowmelt system, check out the second snowmelt training segment. In that segment, we'll look at the snowmelt states of off, melt, and idle, and how different control options allow us to move between those three states.